fabulous show. Alaska. I heard the Alaska. It's hard. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You can hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley. Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. I'd like to welcome our viewers in the state of Washington. We're broadcast out of KWSU-TV, public television in that state. And if you're a first-time viewer, welcome aboard. You are going to experience a wonderful program. We travel across the north sharing stories from remote villages, from Alaska Natives, from Natives across the North, and soon we'll be featuring stories from your state as well. If you'd like to email me, the email address is right there on the screen. We love feedback, and we certainly appreciate being invited to your reservation in Washington. On today's program, we talk about global warming. How it's affecting our native people here, the way we live, the way we see our world. Let's travel now to Non-Dalton, Alaska, situated in one of the most beautiful areas of the world, the world around Iliamna Lake. Non-Dalton, the home of the Denina people. The Denina people are very, very close to the land, as their people have been for always. But these days, the land is offering something different. We'll take a look at the changes in non-Dalton, Alaska. Non-Dalton is a Denina Athabascan Indian village of about 200 people. Originally located on the north shore of Six Mile Lake, the village was relocated to the west shore in 1940 because of wood depletion and growing mud flats in the surrounding area. The people of non-Dalton live a subsistence lifestyle that surrounds fishing, hunting, and berry picking. They have always practiced conservation and preservation of the fish, wildlife, and natural resources of the area. They used to tell us kids, you know, you guys have to learn to do this. You guys got to watch carefully and watch what we're doing. Because in the future, you guys will be using these things. But I was a kid, and I never thought I'd use stuff like that. But we used to do what they used to tell us to do. Well, I really, really didn't get into it until after I got married. It's when I started putting up my own fish, canning my own fish, putting up my own dog foods during the summer. And uh, then that's when I realized this is what grandma and mom meant. Never thought I'd, you know, do these things. But then that's where I learned all that from grandma and mom, especially my mom. The traditions and beliefs of the Athabascan people were handed down through the ages by their oral history. It is only within the last 100 years that these traditions have been documented and written into stories and accounts. The language and belief systems are not entirely unique to Alaska. Their perceptions of nature and human being interaction is shared by all Athabascans in Alaska and their relatives in the lower 48 states as well. By their very nature, every subsistence hunter, fisherman, and gatherer is a conservationist and preservationist. Above all, they maintain the health of their food sources in their traditional ways. Their ability to fish, hunt, and gather is directly dependent on how they treat the resources. If they misuse, abuse, or show disrespect for the fishing game, it will affect the harvest of the next season. To waste any animal or fish was forbidden and was thought to bring bad luck to the hunters or fishermen. If there is little or no fishing game, the entire population could face starvation. When we were young growing up, and you know, in, in my time, you know, they, they told us, you know, when you hunt, you know, animals 
you're, you're not a good hunter, you know what I mean? The animal will give itself up to you if you need them. That's the only time you graft them when you need them. Then you use everything what, you know, what it provides that usable and edible, you know, and um, and then when you get them, you, you treat it with respect, you know, you uh, skin them in a certain way, you know, and treat the bones and meat, you know, you know, as good as you possibly could, you know, out of respect. And like bear too, you know, if you kill a bear, you take his bladder and his eyes and you bury it. You know, it's a traditional thing that, you know, more bears will come, which is too many coming now, you know. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's what they, they used to tell us. Caribou and moose, same thing, you know, you, you treat it with respect. And all the animals and the plants, you know, everything that live living, they, they said, you know, is, I don't know how they know it, but it's providing us, you know, the stuff we need. So treat it with respect, even plants, you know, trees and animals. Everything, you know, is helping us to, you know, subsist because that's all we, we had, you know, and I guess we had to learn to take care of it and to make sure, you know, it, it's always around when, when we needed it. They used to never let us touch salmons when they're cutting fish when we were kids. When we were taught to cut fish with, like, trouts, graylings, and you guys practice on those before you guys could touch the big fish. The only thing they used to have us doing was tie fish bones and hang salmon eggs to dry for the dogs. That's all we were allowed to do with the salmons. <laughs> Today, many of the residents of Non Dalton still live a subsistence lifestyle. However, some families don't because of economic pressures such as the lack of a boat or motor or four-wheeler transportation. These families become dependent upon other family members to get fish and game for them. The downstream effect often means that the children of these families do not benefit from the knowledge passed on from their elders. Without that knowledge, they will not have the skills they need to survive in a subsistence environment. Well, uh, what bothers the people most, I think, here, is, uh, you know, jobs. Uh, before, when I was young, we used to go trapping. That's how we could make our money. But now, the, every, <laughs> every young people is just sitting down waiting for a job. They don't go out in the hills no more. Non-Dalton elder Agnes Kuzma put it so well when she stated that even though the kids nowadays know how to read and write, if you put them out in the wilderness by themselves, they would not know how to survive. It's hard for these youth to understand conservation or preservation when the word subsistence is so foreign to them. One example of preservation is that the people of Non-Dalton would open up beaver dams that were blocking salmon spawning areas for red salmon. If the beavers did not move off to another area, they would be taken. Salmon need to return to the very same place that they were hatched to spawn again. The, the spawning down here was uh, Kijik was the major place. Uh, along, all along on this, this river, all the way down to Nehal and Uliamna, and probably go all the way down to Kujak and places like that. You know. But the main places right here in Uliamna, like in Lake Hark, I noticed that there were real major soccer salmon, just like a paradise, and, and, and they, they came pretty heavy. These spawning grounds are the traditional areas where the people of non Dalton get their brown bear each year. So it's apparent why assuring a spawning ground for the sockeye salmon is so important. This and other methods of conservation are hundreds of years old. They are still applicable today and are practiced with success. All the way up to Lake Clark, where there's shallow spots, where there's gravel on the bottom, you see fish spawning. And that, that, that kind of activity goes on all the way up to uh, uh, Kijik, the kind of uh, major place for salmon. That's why even the whole time, 
they used to go after bear, hunt bear. They go up uh, in that area to get the bear when they want to, when it's time to get it. And that's probably late in uh, October sometime, because the, the bears fatten up and everything. Mm -hmm. But no matter how much these Athabascan people practice preservation and the conservation of their natural resources, they are faced with a dilemma that is beyond their control. Global warming and a changing planet are causing concerns that must be addressed. It really changed it, you know, like especially on going through the past. You know. uh, and then the, after you pass uh, Port Ellsford, the mountain was anywhere uh, 50 feet high or even higher. Mm -hmm. The glaciers sticking all the way you know, across that, between the mountains there. But during the 50s, it seemed like that, that all that glaciers started melting away. Three times, you can see now. You can see how far the glacier was up on a mountain. And you can see it move away back now. What we don't realize is there's this kind of significant change here from what we used to see before. It's either the temperature, Maybe it's uh, gradually getting a little warmer, a little warmer, and uh, you know, it's melting away the snow and ice and glaciers. These photos show a huge change in a glacier over a 37-year period. The photo on the left was taken in 1958, and the picture on the right in 1995 you can see how much the glacier has receded over a short amount of time. The same is true for many of the glaciers across the world. The concerns go beyond the melting glaciers. The changing climate is affecting our people's food source, our lakes and rivers, our ways of life. I am concerned about the way the game, the fish, everything, uh, the way they act. And, and it's, it, it's kind of the way I've seen it before, and that now the way I've seen it, there, there, there's some, like if there was big changes. Like was, I'll just touch on to the salmon. You know, the salmon was somewhere, this whole six mile lake was full of salmon when the impact of the sockeye salmon came. 30, 40 years ago, even 20 years ago, there were a lot of, a lot of salmon, you know. It, uh, everybody, you know, got, in those days, you know, like 20, 30 years ago, everybody used to drive dogs, you know, and they used to put up, you know, dogfish, you know, I mean salmon for, you know, food for the dogs. And, they get enough to last them through the winter and plus some for themselves. Some of the time they get, you know, 1,500 to 2,000 fish, you know, each each family. And now you're just lucky if you get, you know, 100, mm -hmm. you know, 100, 200, you know. And it's so, the past 20 years, it's it been really, you know, uh, depl getting depleted and how, you know, uh, there again, we, we don't know, we don't have to do to the global warming, or, you know, war, water getting too warm, right? I don't know what, what's going on there, but there is lesser fish now than there was. We had a strange uh, fall and the water dropped, and then, as, then we got a lot of rain, and then as the water started raising, and the weather really didn't turn cold, so we had high water up through December and first part of uh, January. And now we should be catching all kinds of fish. Now we're just getting grilling. I noticed that the, the salmon is not going back into Tazana River. Uh, Tazana River here, they start going into Picker Lake. That is really unusual. I never see salmon go up in Pickerley Creek. Yeah. They're spawning there. And that, they act like if they had no choice but to go to Pickerley. 
Studies show that warmer waters increase bacterial and fungal infections in salmon. Warmer waters also cause salmon to burn energy faster. The result is that many of these salmon die in route due to exhaustion and infection, and many stressed salmon that do not make it to their spawning grounds fail to spawn. The effects of global warming can be seen not only in the salmon runs, but also in the vegetation and numbers of other animals that have provided a source of food for the people of Nondalton. Well, some of the animals are disappearing around Nondalton, such as the moose and the caribou. Other animals and insects are newcomers, insects that haven't been seen until these days. Let's travel back to Nondalton and look at some of these changes that the local residents are concerned about. There used to be a lot of moose even around the village, you know. We didn't have one moose, you know. Uh, if we needed it, like for a potluck or whatever you do, we went out and got it. But now you go out and you can hunt, you know, all day, and you don't see no, no moose. Certain years, there's berries in certain places, and there are certain years we don't have er berries at all. There are certain years we have more blueberries, and there are certain years we have more cranberries, and there are certain years we don't have none at all. During this last uh, 10 years and that they came back in here, the caribou did, but then this, uh, they're just not all the way it used, the way it used to be. All of a sudden, you know, they were right here in the village, you know, they were all around the village, down the river, and all over there were caribou up, up the lake where there was no caribou before. There were caribou all over. And they were around here for about maybe five, six years in the past. Two years, two and a half years, you know, they started uh, phasing out, you know, and now there's no, no caribou around. Well, they always said if you have lots of snow, you'll have lots of berries. So this year, everybody's just wondering if we're going to have any berries because there was no snow. And that is perhaps one of the major concerns that is on everyone's mind in Nondalton a village that averages 64 inches of snow per year. With the Earth's changing temperatures comes changing weather patterns and changes in not only the climate of an area, but changes in the kinds of animals that inhabit the region. We never had a problem with roof beetles before, and they're coming through, you know, you know, killing off the trees, you know, and uh, so that's something that, you know, I, I never saw in this area before. And another thing that I never saw, you know, in this area about three years ago, I saw a hummingbird. I guess they're down in the southeast, but we never see you no know, hummingbird up this far, at least in this area anyway. At fish camp we saw, I saw a couple of bugs that I've never seen before. They were um, long and they were, and I've I caught one of them, I found out they were uh, like little locust grasshoppers. We don't have them around here. And uh, we have grasshoppers, but they're real small. They're little green things, not like big fat ones like these were. These you see in the lower 48 and other part of the country. This is not no normal winter around here. You get about two or three foot, foot of snow. But it, it, it isn't, you know. So, I've, I've been talking to Andrew Beluda, and he's also elderly in this area, and I told him about there was, the wolves were <coughs> uh, hanging around their village and killing the dogs and everything here in the village. Mm -hmm. And it's a long time ago they said the wolves should be, be in uh, big packs maybe 30, 40, 50 in the one big pack. When, if there's that many at one time, they're not afraid of anything. Well, the water was kind of high, you know, all winter, which, you know, well, it sometimes happened, but, you know, it drops during the winter and the ice falls in. But this year, you know, it seemed like it stayed, you know, warm and rained all winter, and the lake froze over and it all melted for one little piece right outside the village here. 
And I never saw that happen, you know. I saw warm, but, you know, at least ice, ice stayed, you know. But this, this year was just different. That's, I, never, I never saw that before. There was no snow for the past two, two years. There was no, and before that, Maybe about 10 years ago, the weather started changing, you know, really um, from, you know, we used to get about three, four foot of snow, okay. north wind blows, you know, maybe 25, 30 all the time, you get 20 to 30 below zero. You know, get up to, like I said, three, four foot of snow, and now you don't even get two, three inches. This, this year, we didn't even get an inch of snow, I don't think, all winter. January started to get a little colder and the water started dropping we were everybody's worried that it freeze with the water high and which is bad because you get all the shell ice and this is kind of what happens is that you have a lot of ice shell ice along the beach but this fortunately the ice dropped before the water froze but now the pressure of the ice and uh, freezing is, is pushing the uh, pushing the ice up on the beach, which is, uh, which is a good sign for uh, that the uh, old people would tell you that uh, with the ice coming up on the beach in the spring means that uh, there's going to be a lot of salmon. It'll be a good, good year for salmon. So seeing this, all of this right now, um, I'm pretty excited about the summer that we, we probably have a good run. At least that is what everybody in non-Dalton is hoping for. This graph shows how the predicted ocean temperatures may affect the feeding areas for sockeye in the future. The light blue and red areas indicate the areas that are currently occupied by sockeye during the winter and summer months. However, if the predictions of global warming become reality and the ocean temperatures increase to a certain degree, the sockeye will be limited to feeding in the areas in red only during the summer months, possibly restricting their migration home to their native rivers. For the Athabascan people of non-Dalton, Alaska, there are changes occurring that will forever affect their way of life. For the people who live between two lakes, nature is taking care of itself, healing itself. As the earth warms up and the climates change around the world, the people of non-Dalton will adapt and overcome as they have for centuries. Thank you everyone for joining us for another Heartbeat Alaska. And once again, welcome to our new viewers in the state of Washington. Heartbeat Alaska now is aired from one coast to the other, from Washington all the way across to our good friends in the Seminole Tribe. Hello, my good friends in the Seminole Nation. We're aired on five reservations in Florida. God bless every single one of you. And thank you so much for joining us once again for Heartbeat Alaska.